Hey, welcome again to Discovery. Make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Amen. Hey, we're beginning this brand new series called Freedom, and it's more than a series this year because it is the theme or the word. We're believing that this is going to be the year of freedom in Jesus' name. You're going to receive, we're going to receive breakthrough and healing. How many of you are going on this journey? They believe for the year of freedom, amen? I'm believing it for your life. And so uh, we've designed a, an amazing journey for you, all of our events and series and what's happening with men and women and your youth, all that, it's all kind of coalescing and combining to be a year of freedom and breakthrough for you. In fact, I am releasing and have released a new book by that same title called Freedom. And for those of you that are new to Discovery, you're like, this dude's peddling his own stuff. This is not my, so I don't get nothing from this. This is like none of, none of the sales of this, it ain't mine. This is the church's. This is like curriculum for your freedom. And that's why I wrote it so that you could be free. And we'll actually do some small groups later on this season when small groups launch. We'll launch some freedom small groups. You can grab that on the way out or online, wherever books are sold, actually, you can grab that and cover the eight steps of healing and transformation. I think it'll bless you. In this series, I got all new content for you, so I'm not regurgitating the book. I got some new stuff, a new word for this season that God has put in my heart. We're going to find some freedom today. Amen, somebody? So what I want to do today is I want to set the foundation of the next four weeks, this four-week series, and if you are ready for the journey, set the stage of what could be the most liberating year of your life. I can't tell you how important it is for you to be in church today, to be hearing this. In fact, I believe Satan will do anything to keep you from hearing this series. I believe he will. And here's why. He doesn't want to get caught because when the thief gets caught, he's got to restore a sevenfold of what he stole. That's biblical, by the way. That's Proverbs chapter six. I'm not just making that up. He doesn't want to get caught. Most people, and I would even say most Christians, are not walking in freedom. Because chances are, if you're a follower of Christ, when you got saved, he took, like Jesus took some things, man, and he took some mindsets and some patterns, and immediately you were transformed. But something stuck around, didn't they? And over time, it's possible that something snuck back around in your life. Jesus said it like this in John 10, verse 10. The thief, and he's referring to Satan here, the thief comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. In my experience, too many people are living on the wrong side of this verse. We're living on the wrong side of the comma. Most of our life is characterized by the enemy stealing from us and bringing destruction and havoc. And when in fact, Jesus has given you and has provided for you life and abundant life. Actually, some translations say life abundantly. Now, if the enemy is stealing from you, listen, what that means is that God actually has a purpose. He had a purpose for you. He had something that was yours. It was your right. It was your plan. He has given it to you, but the enemy comes and has taken it from you. And I'm seeing people, their marriages are being taken from them. Their peace is being taken from them. Your children are being taken from you. Your dead. Like there's so much, how in the world are we letting him do this? What the assignment of God, what he has apportioned to us, that the enemy comes through a crack in the door and is able to steal what God has designed. How in the world is this happening? Jesus says, look, he's come to do this, but I have come to take back what the enemy stole from you, that you might have life. And not just life, but life to the full, life in abundant. Here's what the title of the message is today. It's coming from John chapter 8, verse 32. Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. That's the title of today's message. The truth will set you free. That's, that's how you get free. That's how you are going to walk in freedom. It's through the truth of Christ. Let me say it like this. There's another way to say it. You're only as free as the truth you believe. And really, that is the journey of faith. This is your victory, is a journey of discovering and believing truth because Every lie we believe in any form and in any sphere of our life, that place is an area of an, it's an open door of attack to the enemy. Any place we believe a lie in any form, we're going to experience the fruit of robbery, death, and destruction as opposed to life and abundant life. Any area of our life where we've actually bought into a lie, that's what we'll experience. 
robbery, death, destruction. Here's why. A few verses later in John 8, Jesus says this, you are of your father, the devil. Ouch. You know what I mean? So uh, Jesus said some stuff that was hard, hard to hear. At the, and honestly, it's a little bit harder when you even put it in context, because you go back to what Jesus is preaching here, a sermon to an audience of people. In verse 31, he begins it, and it very clearly states that Jesus is talking to, the Bible says, those who believed on him. So these were believers in Jesus following him, and he tells them, you're of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desire. So here's what Jesus is saying. Like, you are an offspring of whose ever desires you're trying to fulfill. This is what he's saying to people who are following him. He's a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is the liar. And Jesus says he is the father of lies, meaning any lie that you believe has its origination, hear me, in hell. Every lie comes from the father of lies. Every place that you are operating by a lie or deception, every in your own life, in your mind, in your relationships, in every area, that's an open door that you are given to the father of lies to produce offspring in your life. Are y'all hearing me today, okay? This is why this is so important. Here, let me say it like this. When you believe a lie, you enthrone the liar. Jesus said he's, he's, he'll become the father. You'll, be, you'll get offspring from that which you believe and desire to do and fulfill in your life. You're enthroning the father of lies in your life. So here's what we're gonna do in this series. We're gonna dethrone the devil. Come on, somebody. We're gonna dethrone the devil from our life in every area that we have given him legal access through our belief in his lies. There's four areas we're gonna cover in this series. Four primary areas, not in your notes, but let me give you the kind of the overview of the journey of where we're going. Because we're gonna dethrone the devil in our habits. In our habits. There's a, some of our habits are actually open doors to the enemy accessing our life. Habits will make you or break you. And it's a great time of the year to start focusing in and getting your habits back on track. I mean, myself included, our habits drift, you guys. We get out of alignment so easily. I'm gonna share with you some freedom habits you need this year. We're gonna dethrone the devil over our inheritance. What do I mean by that, man? See, when it comes to the traits and the genes that we carry, the Bible and science is very clear and has a lot to say about this. Our journey of life is shaped a lot by the legacy of our ancestors, for better or worse. Listen to me, church. Your, pa your parents pass on to you more than your hair color and your height. There was a spiritual transference that was happening there that we need to realize, listen to me, both from our ancestors and from Christ. You know, you got an inheritance from Christ that we need to realize here that we need some freedom in our inheritance. We're gonna dethrone the devil also from our thoughts. Okay, there's some, there's some, some patterns of thinking that don't line up with the truth that sets us free. It kind of, it, it's an open door of lies and deception to the enemy. I know this is the new year and we're all setting new goals and, and, and new resolutions. And that's great, man. I got something. You're like, I want to lose this weight. I want to fix this. I want to read this many books. That's fantastic. But you need to understand your life doesn't begin to change in the doing. It begins to change in the thinking. This is where, this is where change begins. And we need to dethrone the enemy that we have enthroned in our minds because we believe some things. That was the door he got in. And we started giving offspring through our thoughts to the father of lies. How in the world did we do that? Well, it's because you believed the lie. Okay, so we need to dethrone the devil over our thoughts. Here's the last one. We're gonna dethrone the devil over our past. See, see some, this is where I, and this is where I'm gonna begin today. Because for some of us, our past is the open door that the enemy has access into our life. It's how you are thinking and believing about the events of your past that give room and legal access for the enemy to operate. So let me ask it like this. What do we do when our past hurts still hurt? That would characterize a lot of people. What do we do when our past hurts still hurt? Now, don't get me wrong. We all hurt and you're not at fault for hurting. In fact, one of the most unkind things you can say to your pain is that doesn't matter and I should be over it by now. Listen to me, your pain doesn't need another critic, it needs a friend. That's, that's what it needs. But you see, because some of us, you got hurt and you never went on a journey of healing, you went on a journey of hurting. And your past hurt still 
hurts. You know what that journey looks like. We're all familiar with it. We get hurt. And we don't go on a journey of actually letting God heal that thing. We, we go on a journey of hurting. So we got hurt, and then it becomes anger. And we got angry. We got angry at them. We got angry at it. We got angry at ourselves. Man, what was I thinking? We got angry at God. You got angry. And that anger turned to bitterness. This is the journey. We all know this journey, man. And that bitterness, the Bible says, turns into a hard heart. And I want to teach this today so you can find some freedom over your past. Because listen to me, we can't change what we experience, but we can choose how those experiences change us. So follow along with me in your message notes today, because I, I want to encourage you to fill in the, the blanks here. We're going to look at a story that even those of you that have read the Bible, you probably brushed past this story that I want to pull out some truth. It's, it's in Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 27. This is the account of Terah. Terah is actually the father of Abram. That's, that's Abraham after the covenant name that he got from God. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. That was Lot's dad, Haran. While his father Terah was still alive, look what happened. His boy Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, the land of his birth. So this obviously is a premature death because his daddy is still alive here. And while I think it is appropriate and natural almost, right, for a son to have to bury a father, it is almost very inappropriate and unnatural for a father to have to bury their son. And this is what Tara is experiencing. And as I was reading this, I was just, my heart began to sink and feel sick, to be honest. It's the thought of having to bury my son or to bury one of my daughters. And so I can only imagine the wound of Tara and quite possibly the wound of some of you here today of having to bury his boy. Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. And then the story picks up in verse 31. Because of that change of events, it says, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, his past boy, and his daughter-in-law, Sarah, who was his wife, Abram's wife. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans, look at this, to go to Canaan. Let me time out right here for a moment. Canaan is modern day Israel. This is the promised land. I find it very interesting as I was reading the scriptures that Terah, the father of Abraham, actually sent out on a pilgrimage journey, he took his family. There was this, this crisis, this premature death experience, Haran died. And then all of a sudden he says, we're getting out of Ur of the Chaldeans and we're going to the promised land. Could it be, you, some of you may not care for this inference, but, but, but could it be that the calling of God was on this very special family before it was even ever on Abram? I find it just very interesting that Terah, with his entire family, set out on a journey to go to Israel, go to the promised land, the land that would be a future the inheritance that God gave through covenant to, I just, so interesting he does. So he goes, so there's this tragic thing. He's mourning the loss of, of Haran, his, his son. And then, and then he says, we're leaving this place and we're gonna go to the land of Canaan. But then it says this, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, wait a second, is Haran his, his boy's name? Yes but it's actually the name of a city. And so whether, whether it was the name of a city previously already named that, or when Tara got there, he could no longer continue and it eventually just named it that city. And that's the name of that city because they called it that. In, in any case, here's what we know. Somewhere between Ur and the promised land, Tara settled in a place named after his dead boy. He had to come face to face with his greatest past wound that he had ever experienced. And in a place that he was supposed to pass through, he got paralyzed in. Are y'all hearing me today? He settled there in Haran. And then we get one of the most tragic lines in the Bible. Tara lived 205 years and he died in Haran. He never got close to the place he set out to go. He, he, because why? Because he didn't get freedom from his past. Okay, so, see, because there are some of you who are here today, if you were honest, you would say, yeah, pastor, that past hurt still defines me today. Yeah, that, that my, my divorce 
still defines me today. What my dad did or my parents did or what I experienced. So it's a, that still, it, I carry you. It. It's in fact how I parent my kids still today. For some of you, what happened in the schoolyard di- dynamics in elementary school still carries with you. Today, there are things in our past that are paralyzing us and we settled down in seasons that God caused you, called you to break through and pass through. So, so here, I wanna draw out three things from this story. And I want you to follow along with me as we go through the life of Tara to learn how we get paralyzed and what happens when we get paralyzed in our past, especially if it's a past wound or a relational wound. Number one is this, when we get paralyzed in our past, it keeps us from our potential. It's going to keep you from the place you're supposed to go. If you never deal with the past, If you never deal with that problem, if you never deal with the pain, if you never deal with that thing that hurts, it's true. In fact, you probably notice that when you're dealing with a wound, you you become very ignorant, don't you? You become kind of crazy when you're wounded. You can, you do, we all do become, uh, because people make some bad decisions when they are wounded don't you? You're not the best version of yourself when you're wounded. I talk to married couples all the time that are contemplating very serious permanent decisions that would cause even more damage that they, like to them and their family, but they're convinced, oh no, this is, this is, just, this is what we got to do. This is how it's just got to end. It makes no sense. You're just causing more damage. It's not healing. It's hurting. You're going on a journey of hurting, not a journey of healing. Why? Because you're crazy. No, but seriously, we all are in our wound. Psalm 73, let me prove it to you. Here's what the Bible says. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, look what happened. I was senseless and ignorant. That's what happened to me. I was crazy, man. When I was acting like that, when I was yelling like that, when I responded and reacted, man, I was like, I'm sorry. It just like, I was... That's why, by the way, you need some people around you that you trust and that love you deeply when, when you're going through tough times because you need some people that can speak to you honestly and help you because you're not, you're not the smartest person when you're wounded. I'm not the smartest person when I'm wounded or when you're offended and you're going through stuff. You're just not the smartest person. And it's, it's the truth, man. I see it all the time. The enemy comes and he attacks your life and he attacks your marriage and he's attacking a certain area of your life. And, and, and it's not even about that relationship with your dad or your mom or that person or your spouse or whatever. It's not even the enemy. It's, it, it's so much bigger than that. The enemy's purpose, check this out. The enemy's purpose in attacking all those areas, listen closely, every attack of the devil is actually to derail your purpose. It's not about that. He's using the challenge in your marriage to stop something bigger. Listen, he's using Haran to keep you from Canaan. We all get locked in on that thing. And I'm telling you, it's something bigger. We get paralyzed in our cat and our past and we're kept from our potential because we never realize the reality. Every attack of the devil is an attempt to derail us from our purpose. Here's the second thing we learned from the story of Tara. And that is when we have this past wound, it'll pollute all of our other relationships as well. Like it messes them up. Like even the good ones. I don't know if you ever noticed that when you're, when you're wounded, it affects everybody around you. Or maybe have you ever been, have you ever tried to love a wounded person? You ever been in a relationship with a wounded person and you're like trying to love them and you know they love you, but they just don't even know how to love or have a healthy relationship anymore because they're so messed up with the other guy or the other person. You know what I'm talking about? Do y'all know, am I... Uh, or maybe you're that person. <laughs> maybe you're that person. Maybe that, that, that you get angry and you're all, you, just, you just lash. You don't even know where, how. You get triggered and you just like, you say stuff and you cut. You cut somebody to the core, man. And, and then after it's like, why'd I do that? It, it, why did I say that to that person? Like, that's the person, that's the person I, I love. Because the reality was you weren't even responding to them, right? You were responding to your past. And now those people, those people had nothing to do with that, actually have to suffer the pain of your past because you didn't heal. Hebrews chapter 12, 15 says it like this. A bitter spirit is not bad. It's not only bad in itself. Like, man, it's bad that I'm, I'm all messed up about this. But look what it says. It can actually poison and infect all the lives of the people around you. So that's why we, we don't go on a journey of healing. This open door of the enemy in our past that we're not healed from actually is not just affecting us and infecting us. It's poisoning the lives of the people we love around us. What does it do? One, it makes us defensive. It makes us defensive. And y'all don't know what that is, right? Where you put up walls. 
where, where the moment you even see a glimpse of it happening again, of that maybe possibility, a wall goes up and you think you're protecting yourself because I'm never gonna do that again. Ain't nobody gonna hurt me like that. And this wall goes up. And the tragedy is it's not, you're not even protecting your, yourself from hurt again. You're actually preventing yourself from healing. Because the people that God has actually assigned to your life to love you and to care for you and to go, take you on a healing journey and to be a part of that healing journey, they can't have access to the place they need for it to happen. So it makes us defensive. It also makes us distant, right? How many of y'all are like me? When you get hurt and triggered and wounded and or offended or something, like you, get, you just isolate. You get quiet real quick, right? You just, you, you disconnect, you, you withdraw. Guys are famous for this, right? Dudes in your life, come on, all the ladies say amen, right? Okay. <laughs> Dudes are famous for just like, like just shutting down, just, just quieting. And we get what I call cold. It's just a cold heart. It's just like, I don't even care anymore. Shut up. You do care. That's why you're all mad about it and stuff like that. I don't care. I don't even care anymore. It makes us defensive. It makes us distant. Number three, it makes us demanding. Like, like demand, like mean controlling. You ever see someone like, in, you, you have someone in your life that is mean or controlling kind of person. And you're like, what in the world happened to them? How did they get that way? Do you want to know, like, if you have someone that's that kind of way where they're always, like, dominating and controlling everything, anyone in your life like that, you're probably, if you do, listen to me, they're probably the most insecure person in your life. Because insecure people try to dominate and control things. They feel like they got a need to be in control and they need to have power because they got a spirit of insecurity. That's what's happening. Here's, here, someone said this, rudeness is a weak person's imitation of strength. I'm telling you, this, this, this past wound that is paralyzing you, it's not just affecting you. It's actually polluting your other relationships as well. And, and we see that happening in, in Tara's life. I didn't have room to put it in your notes, but in Genesis chapter 12, that's when the call of God comes to Abram. And, and listen to me, Tara's family was fractured. Abram had to leave his daddy's house, leave his daddy, separate and move away because his dad could not get over the pain of loss and the grief of loss in his life. God, his family was fractured. It was originally, he was supposed to be there in the land of Canaan with his boy, a part of this journey that Yahweh has called this very, this very special family on. But he couldn't get over it and it fractured his family. It'll pollute. Here's the most tragic part of this whole deal of getting paralyzed by your past is it destroys our relationship with God like our capacity to connect with him. And I'm, I'm gonna say something very difficult for some of you to receive. Some of you don't even wanna believe this. And this is a truth that you do need to believe because remember, the truth sets you free. And if you are believing a lie, it's an area, an open door of legal access for the enemy to cause some havoc, to steal and kill and destroy. So you might not like what I'm gonna say, but it's a truth that can set some of you free. And that's this. Our relationship with people is inseparable from our relationship with God. In other words, you cannot say you love God and you don't love people. That is a lie from hell. That is a lie from the enemy. Okay? That's, you, you are, if, that's you, if, you, if you're believing that, you need to understand you are, you are believing a falsehood, a lie, and you are playing into the enemy's hand over your life all throughout the Bible. It says you cannot say you love God and you don't love people. It's impossible. Go read 1 John that this book is all about loving God and loving people. In fact, you go read 1 John when it talks about loving people and loving others, it's actually talking about, I want to say every time but one in that book, it's talking about loving people. The people he's talking about is your brothers and sisters in faith. And this is an important distinction because for some of you, you love people outside of the church more than you love them in the church. Because here's what happened. You have what's called like church hurt. You experienced a hurt. You didn't go on a journey of healing. That hurt got you angry and bitter and hard. And you just kind of church hop and shop. And you don't have a place to call your own family. You don't have a covering, a pastor. A, you don't have, you don't, you don't, you don't got none of that. You just kind of, why, why? You playing into the enemy's hands. I promise you, you think you're protecting yourself by being distant and putting up your, your walls? You're not. The enemy knows what he's doing. You're playing into his hands. You're, you have, if that's you, you love God, but you can't stand church people. Here, listen to me. That's an open door of demonic attack in your life. That's an open door. You got an open door. You need to go on a journey of healing of your past, of whatever that was that happened, instead of this journey of healing that got you in a place of a hard heart. 
Come on, am I preaching to somebody today? Mark chapter 11, 25, Jesus says, when you are praying, here's the first thing I want you to do in your prayer life. Forgive. This is it. This is the first thing. When you're, when you're praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. It's, all, it's almost like Jesus saying, before you come to me, just go to them. Here's, here's why. God knows you can't receive what he wants to do in your life and give to you because you have that lie in operation. You are, you have enthroned a liar and you're giving offspring from a different father. And he's like, no, I would love to impregnate you with a new seed. I'd love to give you this, but you're already pregnant. Hmm. This is, this is so important here, you guys, because if healing hasn't been worked out and forgiveness hasn't been walked out, that pain will continue to play out. The truth will set you free. And, and, and some of y'all, you've heard that verse, hey, the truth will set you free, but, but actually, that verse 32, the truth will set you free, verse 31 is the, con like in context, it is, a, it is a more powerful verse when you put it in context. Let me show it to you again in the context. John 8, let me get back up to verse 31. Jesus says, if you abide in my, what? In my word, wait, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Meaning this, if you don't abide in the word, then you are a fake disciple. You're not a true disciple. But if you abide, in my word, that every one of us have access to his teaching, his word. If you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples. And then, if you do that, you will know the truth. And that truth that you're abiding in, that truth will set you free. You ain't, look, you, you don't get free by me shouting it at you. You get free from you abiding in it. Okay, this, it's, it's, it's his word, the tr where the truth comes from. And then we're told, why is it like, what happens here? What's the spiritual dynamic? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Let me, let me kind of connect some dots here of why there's so much freedom and truth. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when you abide in his word, in his word, what, what it does, that, that truth awakens faith. When you agree with the truth of God's word, you make agreement with it. You're making agreement with the wrong, you're making agreement with lies. In areas of our life where the enemy has access, in today's message, maybe it's your past. You're believing some things. You went on the wrong journey, okay? A journey of hurting. But if you just put your faith in and start believing in his truth when you receive the word, it awakens faith inside of you. Now, what is faith? What's faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 gives us the definition of faith. Let me give it to you in the Amplified Bible that actually takes the Greek of the New Testament and kind of gives you the actual like wording of it. Look what it says. Now faith is the assurance. <laughs> Look what it says, the title deed. Faith is your title deed assurance confirmation of things hoped for divinely guaranteed. That's what faith is. Okay, so I hear the word of God. The, I abide in his word and I hear it and it awakens faith in me. And that faith in his word is my time. Here, write it down like this. God's word is your legal evidence and your title deed. Here's what you need to do. With every lie, every area that you enthrone the devil, you go to that devil in the area of your life and you say, here's the title deed. You have no authority. Here's your eviction notice. I abide in his word and I agree with his word and it becomes my divine guarantee of freedom, my title guarantee, my title deed. And I evict the enemy. You have no right in my marriage. This is your, this is my title deed. You got to go. Devil, I'm dethroning you from my thoughts. Here's the title deed. It's what God's word says. I'm not going to, it's not my word. It's not my opinion. It's not any book. It's the word of God that came into agreement that awakened faith. And I bring it to the enemy and dethrone him from every area of my life. So, so here's, here's the journey I want us to go on together. I'm excited. I know I'm excited. Okay. Here's the journey. The journey I want us to go on this year. Let me give you a challenge. Here's the challenge. Give God this year. Give God one year of your life. One 
year of your life and just see what will happen with, with him in charge. Like, do it. Like, go all in, though. Don't just, like, patty cake this thing and don't do, like, your, your, your soft version of Christianity. Go all in. Like, like, meaning, when I mean all in, I mean whatever, whatever we're doing, prescribing for your journey of faith and your discipleship, do it. Like, we're, doing, we're beginning 21 days of prayer and fasting today. If you're ready for this all in journey, okay, God, I'm going to give you reins. Do it. Let's go. 21 days. Of, go on this journey. Starting today, actually, 21 days of prayer and fasting. If you don't even know what prayer and fasting is, we've got a bunch of resources on our homepage of our website. Last Sunday, I preached a message about fasting. You can get some information about the types of fasts and stuff, but just say yes. All right, God, this is it. I'm going to do it. 21 days of prayer and fasting. All right. Baptism is coming up. Okay, I've never been baptized. Let's go. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it by faith. Okay, group thing. The groups are coming up in a few weeks. All right, all right. That's what you're saying, your word, and that's the journey of faith. I'm all in. Let's go. Let me find some one that fits my schedule. I'm going. And then just don't be a consumer. Be a contributor. Um, don't, just, don't just come to church, belong to the church. Come to track one today at 115. Come to track one and learn how you can be part of the family of God and not just an attender in an audience, okay? Become part of the family. And then contribute, get on the team, man. Start making a difference. Learn your gifts and start just serving and, and adding and, and making a difference. Just do it like the play, the play that, that we have here at Discovery for your discipleship journey. There's, there's more beyond that even in discipleship classes called Foundations and the Freedom Small Group for some of you. And I'll just, just say yes and go all in. And some of you are like, well, that's a big commitment. Yeah, I know. I know. Look, look, Jesus said it like this. Anyone who wants to be my disciple must take up their cross daily, deny themselves and follow me. Maybe your version of Christianity isn't working because you ain't doing real Christianity. So let me just, let me help you here. Just one year. Just try it. The word of God, the divine guarantee, the title deed, the truth that sets you free. What it says, I'm going to do. I'm just going to lay down my life and I'm going to do this. With your help, Holy Spirit, I'm going to practice and participate in your word. What, look, I know it sounds like a lot, but some of you have given more time to old boyfriends and girlfriends than that. And you think they're crazy now. You're like, they're crazy. I don't want nothing to do with you. Block them on your phone and stuff. Look, give Jesus 12 months, one year, and just see what could happen with him in control on the throne of your life. At the end of this year, I'm telling you, you're going to look back, and it's going to be the year of freedom. You're going to see, you're going to see uh, his hand. And, and by the way, if you don't, if you don't, not only should you go to another church, but I'll go to another church with you, okay? Because this ain't working. <laughs> if it ain't working, it ain't working. Let's close it up and find something. Because if we're not getting people free, what are we doing here, you guys? I promise you this. It's going to work, though. His word works. Okay, so, so that's, that's my challenge at the beginning of the year. And some of you need to take me up on that challenge. Uh, and, and so as we start this journey, as we start not only the series but the year, I want to give us some starter truths, three of them. Three of them that are in my, these are in my spirit. They're in my heart. The first part of the message, it was like a lot of head stuff, maybe. I need you to receive this in your heart. I need you to believe these truths. It's the truth that can set you free. And it's the truth that'll be the foundation for not just this series, but for the rest of these years. These three truths, you got to get bought in in them. You got to just say, okay, I believe, I believe that. That's what I'm going to choose to believe, okay? Three of them. Number one is this you got to believe. God loves me and is for me. you got to believe that. This God, this God loves. God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. And I'm so passionate about this truth here because there's a lot of people that don't have the right image and perspective of our God. I know maybe you're like me. I didn't have any kind of image of God really when I was growing up. I didn't know I was not growing up in a spiritual home, but the image that was given to me Whenever I did get to church was only a few times in my whole adolescence when I go to Riverside and visit my cousins down there. And, and, and the, I won't name the kind of church it was, but the church I went to, the, the, the pastor would preach in, man, hell, fire, brimstone, and he was pointing like this the whole time, and I felt like he was pointing my chest. I'm like, ah, that hurt, man. So my, my picture of God was, a, was an angry God. He's mad at me, and I suck. And I shouldn't suck. Something's wrong with me. And some of, you, some of you have this picture of God. Some of you believe, look, that because of your past, God loves you less. Some of you believe that because of your past, 
God's plan for your life has somehow been thwarted. Listen to me, that's a lie from hell. That is, that is not the truth. God's not mad at you. He's thinking about you right now, and he's got a smile on his face. He knows what you did last week, and he still loves you, and he's still smiling about you. Look, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. He loves you. <laughs> he's thinking about you. John 3, 16, receive this fresh today. John 3, 16 in the Message Bible. This is how much God loves the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. Remember what the enemy came to do, steal, kill, and destroy. By believing, that's the key, it's believing in his truth. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go through all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger at you, condemning you, telling you how bad you are. No, he came to help you. That's what the Bible says. Hey, you got to believe this. God loves you and he's for you. Here's the second truth. You got to believe it's the truth that'll set you free. Write it down like this. I can be free. Like some of you have given up on that and you need to know the truth. I can be free. In fact, say those four words out loud with me. One, two, three. I can be free. Yes, you can. You can be free. Jesus said in John 8, 36, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I can. I'm going to believe that again. Look into my eyes. You can be free. You don't have to live with that fear anymore. You can be free. You don't have to live with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts. You don't have to live this way. You don't have to be an addict. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You don't have to be bound. You can be free. This is the truth that, that the enemy does not want you to believe. I can. That's not who I am. That's not my story. I can be free. Romans 8 says it like this. You no longer have to live under that continuous, low-lying black cloud covering your life, limiting you. A new power, it's available. A new power is in operation. It's the spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind is blowing magnificently clean your air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of you being dominated by brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Here's what, here's what that means, that those things that are dominating you, God wants to give you dominion of. You have power, the spirit of life, the spirit of power, the spirit of freedom lives inside of you. Second Corinthians chapter three says that the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom. This is the kind of follower of Jesus. This is the kind of disciple you're going to be. You're going to be the kind of disciple that, that the living God, the spirit of life, the spirit of peace, the spirit of power, the, the power of resurrection, the spirit of life lives in you so powerfully that when you walk into rooms, atmospheres change. That the authority is, that's inside of you trumps every attitude and every evil spirit bows to the authority of Jesus. This is the authority you have. This is the spirit that God has given you. Freedom, write it down like this. It's not just the removal of evil. It's the presence of God's spirit. So, which leads me to point number three. And after I give you this one, don't stir just yet because I want to end kind of special way together. And that is you can not only be free where God takes it away, but he can turn it back into something powerful. I need you to believe this powerful truth. It's a truth that'll set you free. Write it down like this. I can be restored. I can be restored. You think you messed up the plan. Like I messed it up. Can I have a lesser version then, God? Can I get a plan B? You forget that we serve a God who can restore a sevenfold. Like, like you can. We serve a God who after even Job's family and financial collapse, God blessed them even greater. We serve the God who, after Peter's faith collapse and denial, restored him to the greatest leadership of the church. Okay, this is, this is, sometimes the worst things that happen to you can bring out the greatest blessings for you. I can be restored. God can write that into the story and make something beautiful. Now receive, Psalm, Psalm 71, verse 20, receive this. Look, though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter. That's part of the story. And that's where some of you got paralyzed. Some of you settled there. Some of you settled in Heron. The troubles, the bitterness, the worry. We got caught there. God had a journey for your life. He had a destination for your life. There was a promise you were heading to. At one point you were going there, but you settled. Though you've made me see troubles, 
many and bitter. Look what it says. You will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you'll bring me up again. It's a truth that'll set you free today. It's a foundational truth for this series, for the season, for the year. I can be restored. Now, inside of your, your bulletins, there's a special connection card. Do me a favor, grab that connection card with me. Put that in your hands for a moment. On the back of the card, it says freedom. For everyone who's here today or watching, listening today, wherever you're at, if you're gonna go on the freedom journey, then I want you to fill out this card. If you're saying, maybe for some of you it's this four weeks, you're like, okay, I'm gonna do the four weeks. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a journey. For some of you, you need to take me up on the challenge of one year, and you know it, you're like, I'm going, let's, let's do this. If you're gonna go on the freedom journey, I want you to fill out this card. At the end of the service, at, on your way out, there'll be multiple places at all the exits, at all the booths for you to turn in your card, and I'm gonna give you this freedom keychain. I just, I wanted to, I wanted you to have something on your person all year for you to remember what God wants to do this year. So, so you turn in the card, you get the freedom. You don't get it unless you turn in the card now, okay? So, so I want you to get it. At any booth, all the exits, you'll just grab it like swap. So here's, if you're going on the journey, here's the declaration we're saying. I commit to wholeheartedly embracing the liberating truths of God's word, dispelling every deceptive chain that seeks to bind me. With unwavering determination, I affirm that freedom is not just a possibility, but a reality within my grasp. I declare with confidence and conviction, I can be free. I will be free, and I will actively walk in the glorious freedom that awaits me. This is the declaration that we're making together. And then there's five options, A, B, C, D, and E. And I want you to check off the boxes that relate to you and your freedom journey. Some of you need to select that A box where you're saying, I need freedom from my habits. And I already know it, my habits are my weakness. It's an open door of attack to the enemy. I know I need freedom in my habits. Some of you need to go to B. I need freedom from my inheritance. Like I, that's some things that were in, uh, I inherit passed on to me that I need to break those strongholds in Jesus' name. See, some of you need freedom from your past, what we're talking about today. You settled in places God meant for you to pass through. All right, you're, you're paralyzed somewhere because you're past. You went on a hurting journey instead of a healing journey. And you may need to check that C box. In D, some of you, you need freedom from your thoughts. You know, in your mind, you get negative and critical and defeated and you get doubty and, and you need freedom in the mental battle. And E, those of you that are saying, I am totally free. And if that's you, way to go. Way to go. I'm so happy for you. Just, hey, if that's you, check it off. Just know this, I'm putting you on the prayer team and your holy hands are touching people, okay? I'm just saying. You're gonna, we're not gonna waste that, okay? So, some of you need to check off a lot of those, right? And that's okay. There's a, there's a spot for your prayer request to go on there as well. We're gonna be praying during 21 days of prayer and fasting over all these requests. These cards will be available every week as God reveals to you through his word, listen to me, through his word, as we abide in it, faith will be awakened, truth will be revealed, and there might be something new. You go, oh, shoot. And you check that off, and you write a new prayer. And we go on this journey. We just go on a journey of healing instead of hurting together. In a moment, we can turn in those cards, and after the service, we can do that. But I'd love to, I'd love to pray for us on this first Sunday of the year and pray for our past that maybe has paralyzed some of us, for us to finally be free of some things that we settled in, Okay. But first, probably the, the first prayer that, that needs to happen for some of you is, is you just didn't know that this God loved you and was for, for you. you. You just didn't know. You didn't have the image. Maybe your image of God was like a one of rules and regulations and a list of to-dos and where it's angry or mad. And you didn't know that this God loves you and is actually for you. And, and maybe you've never surrendered your life to him, like control. You're still in control and trying to do it your way, whether it's part your Part of your life has been given to him, but not all of it. And today, you just need to surrender. I'd love to help you make that decision. Maybe for some of you, it's the first time to ever make it. For others, you need to make it again, and it's a great day to make it. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world 
for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.